Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala barakatuhu. That was a little quiet. I need a little better greeting than that. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah. Um, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala ashraf al-anbiya wal-mursaleen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin al-Fatihi lima gulik wal khatimi lima sabaq Nasr al-Haq bil-Haq wal-Hadi ila suratika al-Mustakeem wa la alayhi haqi qadrihi wa mugdari al-Azim So we're going to begin this session with where Dr. Jackson left us which is with a fundamental question how did we end up in this place where you have this extraordinary development um, of African-American Islam, where for, for me, I know the statistics can be read in a number of ways, but I still maintain that the, the single largest contingent amongst the American Muslim community is the black Muslim community. And I can uh, erase the ambiguity over the first or second by including the African-born <laughs> um, in that um, group because the African-born uh, Muslim community is also largely overlooked and largely ignored. And from my standpoint, as somebody who works on the history of Muslim thought in West Africa, paying careful attention to African Islam is part of paying close attention to African-American Islam. So we'll begin with a, with a source that helps us understand how we, uh, how we got to where we are. This is from um, a, a text um, from the 1840s written by a Christian evangelical preacher. Um, it's called Pro-Slavery Interpretations of the Bible that are Productive of Infidelity. Um, the argument of this author in the 1840s was that efforts to proselytize, to teach Christianity amongst uh, the enslaved African community were bound to fail when the Bible was being used as a bludgeon to beat um, slaves over the head with. Look, if you're good, you can serve your white masters in heaven just the same way that you serve them on earth. <laughs> that was not likely to produce lots of converts amongst the, the, the enslaved Africans, so reasoned this author. And in this particular text, he cites a story um, that is illustrative of this um, that had taken place um, some decades before he sat down to, to pen the book. In the year 1806, on the arrival of a slaver from the coast of Africa, John Doherty went to the city of Savannah to buy slaves. After several hundred had been sold and lots and single as suited the purchasers, a middle-aged man was put upon the stand who wished to make a communication before he was sold, the purport of which was that he was a Mohammedan, and that whenever the hour of prayer and other devotional duties came, he must have time to attend to them. Mr. D., who had lately embraced religion and seemed to be zealous to promote the cause, gave the highest price for him, feeling confident within himself he would soon convert him to the true faith. Taking him to his plantation, he built him a hut and assured him that he should be allowed the time he required and in addition should have every opportunity to attend all the meetings of the Christians. The Mohammedan slave for a while attended these meetings and learned something of Christianity without, however, discontinuing his former devotions. At the expiration of about a year, his master, who was intent on his conversion, asked him formally if he did not prefer Christianity to Mohammedanism and if he would not openly renounce the prophet and acknowledge Christ. The slave asked if the Christian religion allowed one Christian to hold another in slavery and their children after them. The answer, of course, was in the affirmative. The Mohammedan replied that the religion of the prophet did not allow that. The result of all was this slave, in a land of Bibles and gospel ministers, daily said his prayers, performed ablutions, made his prostrations, and at an advanced age died, declaring that God was one God and Muhammad was his prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the answer, the beginning to the answer of the question of how we get here in the African-American um, community to where Islam becomes this central part of our identity um, in the second half of the 20th century is that at, its, at our foundations, at our origins as an African-American community, Islam was already present. Um, According to the most conservative and responsible estimates, and as a you know, historian, I did my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, so I'll also rep Philly just ever so slightly. Um, spent about three and a half years there. Um, 
Uh, I got no claim on either of y'all with uh, in terms of Philly props, but um, as a as a professionally trained academic historian, the responsible um, numbers that I circulate for um, the number of enslaved uh, Muslims that were brought amongst the total uh, slave population is that it, it runs between 10 and 15 percent of the total volume of the Atlantic slave trade. And that total volume of the Atlantic slave trade is between 13 and 20 million people. <laughs> um, now, 10 to 15 percent of that number might sound like a relatively small number. However, um, that 10 to 15 percent makes Muslims the largest single contingent amongst the enslaved population. They outnumber any specific African ethnic group in the um, group of slaves that are brought to the New World. So while there are very few times where Muslim slaves represent a majority amongst a specific enslaved community, um, there are lots of times in Savannah at the beginning of the 19th century, the South Carolina Sea Islands, the Georgia Sea Islands at the beginning of the 19th century was one of these times where Muslims were often a plurality. They were the largest single group amongst the enslaved population. And as the largest single group amongst the enslaved population, they had an extraordinary impact and contribution to the culture of the enslaved, whether Muslim or not. Which is another way of saying that Islam gets hardwired into African American identity, period. Not um, always as, um, uh, a fully coherent system of religious belief and practice, but always as a part of the basic cultural elements of what it means to be a black person in this place. And that process started on Savannah Docks um, and in, uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, and in places like New York City and in places like Baltimore in the 18th century. So when people try to represent um, Islam as something that is alien to the Western experience, alien to the American experience, we need to be in the position to remind them that African Muslims are present in Western societies long before the founding of the United States of America. The first documented instances, um, putting aside any claims about kind of pre-Columbian um, Muslim uh, presence in the, in the Americas, but the first documented instances that can be uh, shown to be uh, completely unambiguous show that there are Muslims present um, in um, the Spanish colonies in, in New Spain in the 1500s, um, the first decade of the 16th century. So there are you know, Muslims in the Western Hemisphere um, 250 years before the Declaration of Independence. Um, this idea that um, Islam is somehow external to what America is does not hold up to historical scrutiny. And um, the, the first time that I had to do a live television program in the Wolof language, which is my uh, primary research language for doing research in Senegal. Try doing live TV, by the way, in your third language. Um, <laughs> you'll never be nervous um, teaching a class again after doing live television in your third language. Um, but I, the, the subject was Islam in the West, and I, I used this wall-off expression um, to, to explain, uh, and, I'll, and I'll repeat it here. Um, it's like um, Islam in the West is like uh, coffee with milk, Mangabole nan mangabole tur, which means uh, you either drink the whole thing or pour the whole thing out, <laughs> because you can't separate the coffee back out from the milk. Um, the one <laughs> they they have become so thoroughly imbricated, the one with the other, um, that you either got to drink the whole thing or you got to pour the whole thing out. But you can't try to to separate Islam out as if it's no part of the Western experience. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing, and I'm just going to mute the video for just a moment to move through the slides. Okay. So that's part of how we understand what the origins and antecedents. Um, a lot of times when African American Muslims um, 
talk about their conversion experiences. They talk about it in terms of reversion, not in terms of conversion. And there's all kinds of um, pieces of stories that, that people will tell you where something in the religion seemed familiar to them from the beginning. <laughs> there was something that was familiar about it. And that has um, a, a lot to do with the fact that Islam was part of the basic cultural milieu. Now, how did this, this come to happen? It was, uh, this came to happen because Islam was um, absolutely central to the African experience before the rise of the Atlantic slave trade itself. And this, to return to the, to the point that the sister raised about the kind of separation and marginalization of the black um, Muslim community in America, which is of course also what Dr. Jackson has written extensively about, this is often overlooked. Africa is ignored in the way that our communities tell the story of Islam.